You know, I propose that we are fragmented human beings in many ways. Our psyche, just based on our formative traumas, our upbringing, of course, all of the distortions that our, our culture implants in us, that we accept uh, being born in a physical reality with all of its inherent pitfalls of having to survive, having to remain clean, but healthy, breathing in toxins, expelling toxins. Like, the whole experience is pretty stressful for this consciousness, right? And so if we are to reach a higher order, we need to integrate all of those fragmented parts. We need to see them and know them. Because if they're in the way and we're avoiding them, there's no way we can actually be whole and we can accommodate for the light and understanding of a greater capacity without knowing those parts, without understanding them, integrating them, loving them, whatever it is, and then clearing them. So in order for us to grow more, we need to know what is keeping us locked down. I think it's easy for us as humans to get stuck in, in all of these exciting material distractions. And because we are made to be first and foremost biological creatures who have forgotten their spiritual nature, it's very common for us to get fixated on the survival circuit and to stay in that circuit and, and really, you know, a lot of us are super fixated now on technology and that, you know, maybe we will or not get into that, but that will spell doom for the humans. We let just for the sake of argument assume that their impersonal laws would shape our existence so that everything can be the way it is, right? So that we can be in our physical reality, so we can think, talk, speak, there can be wind, water, with all of its laws, right? And when we don't understand the inner laws of consciousness, we all pray to them. You know, even if we look at an astrological sort of influence, uh, the influence of the constellations and the planets in our space, our place in space, if we are not aware of those influences, then they will make us do certain things because we are unconscious and we sort of we can be more prone to be angry or more prone to be cheated or lied to on a certain day or be jealous or whatever it is to have no inner sovereignty to have no boundaries um, but that's because we are blind to the forces once we start individuating and looking deeper and purifying those unconscious parts then that hidden hand that you speak of then that like you know being the, the chickens in the pen, then we can start realizing like, wait a minute, that's a fence, and there's something outside of the fence, wait a minute, I could go outside of the fence, and those are steps of conscious evolution, of understanding and broadening our, our understanding of So you just watched a clip from the movie In Shadow, which you can still watch for free on YouTube, it's a 13 minute animated movie that has been watched more than 5 million times. And in this podcast episode, I'm interviewing the creator of this movie, Lubomir Arso. We went quite deep with his views about reality, society, the shadow side of our culture, his uh, spiritual awakening journey, and also some of the symbols and concepts that he created. So I hope you're going to enjoy listening to this podcast episode and Let's enjoy the show. All right, so this is Mike Segula from truthfear.com, and this is Truthy Podcast Episode 6. And my guest today is Lubomir Arso, originally from Bulgaria. He moved to Canada at the age of 12. Lubomir is an award-winning artist and animator. He worked on some major Hollywood productions such as The Ice Age and The Book of Life. He's the mastermind behind a movie called In Shadow, which he directed and produced. In Shadow has been watched roughly 5 million times, both on YouTube and Vimeo. The movie takes the viewer on a journey through the fragmented unconscious of our modern times so they can face the shadow. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, um, I must tell you that this is uh, one of my top five movies. <laughs> mm. And I remember exactly um, when it came out. It was November 
2017, uh, my good friend Gavin Nascimento, who is an activist, I think he saw it first and he sent it to me. And, uh, you know, I was pretty blown away. He was like, just make sure you put headphones on because the music fits perfectly the mm. the animation so we're both like we're, we're big fans of these kind of movies i mean you know documentaries like zygas and all these kind of uh films and this is uh in shadow is something that i kind of still recommend to a lot of my friends to see um you know when they wake up or they're on this journey of awakening Mm-hmm. This is like, I think it's uh, easily digestible a piece, you know, you don't have to spend hours on researching something, you get compressed piece of information that is ma- makes you think, you know, about what's happening. So, um, you know, I just wanted to acknowledge um, your work and thank you for uh, putting it together. I, th- I really think this is an amazing piece of work. And I, I would like to start by just asking you, you know, what was your um, process of awakening? Because obviously from the movie, we can see you have a lot of knowledge um, and you have views about how the world works on different levels. So maybe you can start by just explaining the journey. Was it through education or just intuition or some experiences you had? Like maybe you can tell us about the whole process on your end. Hmm, yeah, it's a tall order, but I'll try. Um, and thank you for the good words. That's that's very good to hear. Um, um, so, yeah, my, the, my process of quote-unquote awakening, I think the term awakening gets thrown around very uh, easily. Uh, I actually don't like the way it's used by many people and maybe whatever you want to call it, the truth community, etc. And I, I feel there are individuals who have different gradations of the word awakening and I what I understand from you saying uh, by awakening is I, I suppose awakening to a greater reality that's other than what is presented as the dominant narrative of you know corporations work like this human beings do these kind of things uh, countries relate to each other in this way uh, wars sometimes just happen these other things just happen that kind of narrative I think is when someone peers through it with a sufficient amount of evidence um, and snaps out of it, I think that's what I imagine that's what most people think uh, awakening means. Um, there's, to me, there's a higher order of awakening, of course, when we see through the illusion and actually live and exist beyond the illusion fully. And I think very, very few people, if any, on our earth right now can speak about that. And perhaps no, I don't. No, I'm a, <laughs> I'm I'm climbing my climbing up, up the rocks, up the you know getting cuts, falling down sometimes, um, breaking my nails, climbing more. Sometimes it's beautiful, sometimes it's not. Uh, but I think that's what the awakening journey is. But to answer your question, um, for me it happened with I I went through in my teen teenage years through the more usual Western tutelage of going through philosophy, going into you know, social studies, etc. Uh, and then in my early 20s, uh, finally embarking upon, you know, the journey of entheogens, um, shamanism, and really experientially peering behind the veil and, and really experientially feeling, knowing, seeing, uh, having my perceptions descrambled uh, from the cultural veil, uh, from just the, the general veil of my own personal filters and the cultural filters that prevent prevented me uh, from seeing reality and of course th- those partly are still there in various degrees um, so with the entheogens etc um, you know I started getting into many of us um, especially you know European descent because of modern times we've lost touch to our own folk roots we've lost uh, track to our own native wisdom you know, I come from Bulgaria we went through you know tumultuous history our own deep nav- native wisdom um, a lot of it has been lost a lot of it is re-emerging but um, you know went into the eastern sort of school of thought which is very informative um, it still helps me a lot and beyond that started getting into more of the um, western esoteric traditions um, 
and there's a lot of wealth of information, insights, and techniques in, in unveiling the inner landscape and understanding how the inner landscape creates the outer experience. Um, and from there, of course, I started the more parapolitical awakening of, you know, what the machinations are behind the external world as we experience it um, happened when, you know, uh, very similar probably to you and many others, when things did not seem right about, um, you know, 9-11, um, of, of course. And from there, the journey started un unraveling more and more because I was sufficiently prepared now from my entheogenic experiences, more and more contemplations, meditation, um, I reached a more subtle level of, of perceiving and weaving reality together. In, in like, a way, um, yeah. No, sorry. sorry, go on. Okay, yeah. I mean, just coming back to like your experiences uh, with, was it ayahuasca or psilocybin, like these kind of compounds? Yeah, it was still psilocybin for me initially. Um, those were that's what opened up the a lot of the, the portals of, of deeper perception and recontextualized my reality and really showed me my participation. Uh, how what uh, how I was in in a way primarily responsible for my experience in this world, regardless of the outside inputs, and how through my perception, through my um, processing of the outer inputs, I was contributing back to it, whether I was confirming the reality that was given to me, you know, and in a way it's like black magic or any magic is like, tries to get you to consent to something. And when we unconsciously regurgitate and consent to that reality, we just project it back and we, we create this, this closed loop. And some of those things started unraveling for me. Yeah, it's interesting that a lot of people who go through these experiences have the, like this realization that this is all kind of projection of the collective mind or something like that and we are kind of influencing reality is this something you felt i'm i'm uh feeling deeper into it now and that's my process is i am looking and working into experiencing that more fully as a waking walking acting realization and it, it wasn't so much the case 10 15 years ago but it is so much more the case now um so yes i am observant and it's it's an ongoing project of deepening into the experience of seeing how i am creating my reality um, you know it doesn't mean i'm creating everything uh, it's, that's obviously a complex a uh, spiritual, philosophical, meta metaphysical topic, but I'm really just interested in my own personal experience because that's the only way I can verify anything. And you mentioned uh, some Western esoteric teachings. Can you name some concepts or some ideologies that influence your views? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the looking at, um, of course, the classics, uh, Manly P. Hall has, has outlined many of the, the basics of, of those teachings. Um, the Kybalion is, of course, a, I don't know if you've read it, but it's, it's, it's a great treatise on the fundamentals and the keys of, of starting to peer and understand reality. Uh, Manly P. Hall has an excellent book called the, um, I think it's, it's called The Ancient Philosophy, which elucidates a lot more of, of that. And there's there's um, analogous to to these teachings. They they really dovetail very nicely into, of course, Carl Jung's um, continuation of that that lineage uh, and his elucidations of, of for our modern minds of the alchemical teachings and the inner work necessary to to sort of like um, yeah to 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 bring to a higher order the inner world to synthesize to to integrate the fragmented uh, aspects of us and the main thing i have been working with is um what i think these days would be probably a triggering topic if it's not properly framed but the masculine and feminine or the the goal flow active passive um components of reality of of, of our universe 
and and working with those within myself and seeing them in the world and how they interact uh, you know how the divinity sun how it acts against the material earth uh, what that means within our psyche within our experience the autumn autumn automated state of uh, matter which goes into patterns and it's very programmable and then the the the, not, the, the creative capacity of, of, of spirit which impregnates matter and when those two work together they they create a, a they spiritualize matter into a higher order so that it elevates and it evolves and that's a that sounds somewhat abstract but it's actually super discernible within our own inner world uh, for instance if we wake up every morning and we go into the same patterns of like projecting our understanding of this is you know this is what politics are this is how I feel about this person um, I'm just gonna be tired play some video games going into that same pattern that's more like succumbing to matter to pattern to history right but if we want to change, if we want to imbue ourselves with something higher and really be present, we have to call in, we have to make available ourselves for a higher consciousness spirit. That means we have to start feeling and peering into the patterns and infusing them with awareness so that we can gain presence fully within ourselves, within our bodies, and thus bring all that into a higher order so that we can start bringing choice and free will into matter, which I would argue when it's unconscious it doesn't have free will so we have to earn our free will by constantly seeing where we're automatically acting and behaving um, yeah it seems like if you look at evolution you know reptilian kind of brain there is a lot of uh, just mechanisms based on external stimuli and instincts and then the higher complexities neurocortex um, neurocortex makes you more kind of like think be more aware be more present make decisions not only based on these simple factors so this seems like it's a you know evolution goes towards this pattern of complete self-awareness and complete free will and you know making decisions without mm -hmm. having programs running in the background it seems like yeah, a lot of people who are more kind of on this path, they they notice when they are programs, you know, running their lives or or not. Like I can see a lot of people who are repeating patterns without noticing them at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's interesting because we we need patterns to evolve to a certain point, right? So in in order for us to function. In reality to walk to eat uh, we need to internalize patterns so that they're automated so we you know we don't have to think about talking or walking or running or you know sending emails whatever so so it's almost like we need to it's like training martial arts and art and whatever it is the repetition of the movement ingrains it and so it becomes a, a new baseline but the problem is when we are very practical and just oriented toward gaining those skills it's like they're necessary but at some point yeah we have to reach beyond them and i i agree with uh gi gurdjieff um who says you know it's evolution is not it's conscious evolution is not something that happens and i, I agree with this more and more it, it's not an automated process conscious evolution can only happen when there's conscious will that is developed that that actually chooses and brings itself up through work and the work ne necessitates suffering because suffering is is basically it's suffering is not self-flagellation suffering is just the it's the the result of bringing consciousness to the unconscious of like de thawing pain trauma um ancestral uh, genetic uh you know whatever it is um there's just many layers of, of gunk of, of weight and obstructions to our light so that process in itself of seeing it processing it and integrating it and growing beyond that is like is suffering <laughs> mm. um, what about like maybe let's just before we're gonna start going deeper into 
like the meaning, the shadow side, um, and the symbolism. Maybe you could just quickly give us some idea on the, on the process of making the movie. You spent a couple of years, right? Like a lot of people don't know how much energy goes into creating a 13 minute movie, right? Yeah. Like what was the process of like getting the ideas? Was it just like one day you woke up, you had this idea or hmm. was it something that, you know, gradually evolved over a period? I'm just curious because I'm always interested in this artistic process. I'm, you know, I'm working on some other projects, like some books and ideas for books. And some of these kind of happen instantly. Sometimes it's like a long process, many years, these ideas kind of formula, formulate. So I'm just curious, what was your process like? Mm -hmm. So it did come, it came as an idea and it wasn't fully, fully there. Uh, around 2012 so it's very fitting because a lot of us are around 2012 of course and before that we're doing a lot of thinking research talking uh, you know assuming many things about the this um, potential reversal uh, or or a time of revelation a time where we had to see what is really going on and and, and bring ourselves as humanity to a higher order and that that was the, the mythology that a lot of us were uh, resonating with and based on that and based on the consumption of, of my so-called dark unveilings of, of the world and what what was really happening according to what I understood um, that came to a the just the sum of all those parts for me came into some sort of like visual explosion in my mind and I started seeing this audio visual presentation experience and the possibility of that actually being real and it was after seeing I Pet Goat 2, which made me feel like, okay, so there is an audience for this. People do understand more abstract symbolic images and and are they do work on the psyche, they work on the subconscious, they work on the, the heart and they do something. And maybe we don't exactly know what it is, but there's a, a, a deep, um, yeah, an impregnation of like deep feelings. And that really inspired me. And so uh, having a, a notion of, of the general project that, that I then started to, I put it aside for a few years, started working, and it was around, I think it was 2015, I, I was working on a, on a, on a, like an animated Hollywood movie, and I quit because I couldn't, <laughs> I, I felt it was just so, um, so meaningless. So I quit, and I took a year off. And I basically worked on In Shadow. And the process was I wrote a very minimal, basic script. Um, I broke down the hero's journey of how I wanted the, the audience to see and experience this weaving together of this tapestry of our uh, culture, our experience, and the modern world. And, where, and to recontextualize what we took for granted, like our experience with a doctor or our experience with, with a politician, I wanted to recontextualize that in a way that brought what I perceived to be more of a reality. It's almost like clairvoyantly seeing through what we're presented and seeing something of its heart. Uh, it's funny, some people have, have mentioned, and I really, I take that compliment to heart, some people have said that In Shadow is a documentary. Or uh, it's, it's funny hearing that from different people. But so after uh, writing it, I, I thumbnailed the whole film. I, I plotted out the basic images um, and then just went into, you know, drawing all the assets. It's, I don't want to get too technical here for the audience, but um, yeah, to save because it was done basically on no budget with some very helpful artists who composited the images. I, I drew the images. I separated them all in, you know, in layers, and they were under my direction where we created uh, the rest of the film, so that in a way that every image could be, in those two to three short seconds that we saw it, we could glean its meaning. Uh, but the intention was to have this barrage that was perceptible, yet people would want to stop and see that there would be... Um, like repeatable viewing value in it and I wanted it to be concise enough so that it really hit hard as a full experience because it covered it covers so many things 
um, if that was done in like a three you know hour documentary or a ten part series, it loses some of that momentum. But when we encapsulate this whole experience of being human from this one point of view that I present, and then sort of like breaking out of it at the end to see see it from this other greater vantage point, I feel that that little package that's like a, a little you know red pill that. I was hoping would be effective in some way. Okay. Um, so as a description, you actually included Carl Jung's quote, no tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. Um, can you elaborate what is the meaning behind it? Why you included it as a mm -hmm. description of, of the movie? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a very apt, very apt um, and insightful quote. And um, Carl Jung says that if you have any aspirations for a higher way of being, of knowing higher worlds, or a, just you know a, a, a greater way of, of being present here in this world, then you need to see um, those things that you are not aware of, those things that are stuck in some in something else um, and I'll elaborate on that we are you know I propose that we are fragmented human beings in many ways our psyche just based on our formative traumas our upbringing of course all of the distortions that our, our culture implants in us that we accept uh, being born in a physical reality with all of its inherent pitfalls of having to survive having to remain clean but healthy, breathing in toxins, expelling toxins, like the whole experience is pretty stressful for this consciousness, right? And so if we are to reach a higher order, we need to integrate all of those fragmented parts. We need to see them and know them because if they're in the way and we're avoiding them, there's no way we can actually be whole and we can accommodate for the light and understanding of a greater capacity without knowing those parts, without understanding them, integrating them, loving them, whatever it is, and then clearing them. So in order for us to grow more, we need mm. to know what is keeping us locked down. Um, you know, it's um, uh, re my most recent guest, Daniel Pinchback, not sure. Yeah, I know, I know Daniel, yeah. He was talking about how tools that we create, like plastic, for example, are just showing as our shadow side. So you have a plastic bottle, which is convenient, easy to produce, but pollutes the environment, right? So it's like these things we created are actually a reflection of that shadow side, and they are stopping us from evolution, right? Because now we are destroying the climate, you know, the planet, um, you know, all these different things that are reflection of what's going on inside of us and the tools that we created uh, are actually slowing us down to reach higher level or maybe can even bring our doom in the result. That's, um, yeah, what, what do you think about that? I guess this mm -hmm. is something yeah i think i think it's easy for us as humans to get stuck in in all of these exciting material distractions and because we are made to be first and foremost biological creatures who have forgotten their spiritual nature it's very common for us to get fixated on sort of the survival circuit and to stay in that circuit and, and really you know a lot of us are super fixated now on technology and that, you know, maybe we will or not get into that, but that will spell doom for the human spirit if it keeps going the way it's going right now. But um, so Daniel saying that plastic is in a way a projection of our shadow. Um, yeah, I could see that. I mean, especially if, 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 you know, you know, plastics are made from petrol, from like fossil fuels and if fossil fuels actually do come from dead creatures from past millennia you know we're turning those into plastic and stuff there's something interesting there but i do feel that in order for us to evolve in this spiral of like 
there's a cyclical nature yet it's an as hopefully it's a ascending cyclical nature we need to make these mistakes and we need to do various things in order to evolve as, as humanity like wars in a way by for those that let's say were not manipulated heavily wars that happen naturally out of territorial needs and like resource needs and other things especially further back those things in a way unfortunately were necessary for that conscious evolution what it means to create boundaries what it means to have borders or not have borders just like our cells and our bodies and our skin we border ourselves constantly from the environment we let it in we can get sick or be resilient there's all this stuff that we need to learn so yeah there's times for walls there's times for no walls there's times for castles there's times for you know it just really depends we can't it's difficult to also judge individuals um, based on individuals in history, etc. Because um, every age has its own lessons to be learned. Where what what I find troubling, and I don't know if you agree with this, is when people, for the most part, are not aware that they are being steered by other interests uh, into their own doom, into their own dis disempowerment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something interesting, but on the other hand, you know, people make choices in a way, right? So you either spend your day on entertainment and mindlessly browsing through some junk food on social media, or you can spend it on educating yourself. And, um, you know, like, for example, Amazon, right? The, one of the most powerful co corporations in the world. A lot of people complain about uh, Jeff Bezos not paying taxes or, you know, exploiting their workforce. But then 50% or more of people in the US have Amazon Prime. So, you know, it's a kind of these corporations adapt because of our convenience, you know, they, they want to serve us better and then we allow it. Mm -hmm. so this is the side effect that they create and without our choices and without um, our permission in a way they wouldn't be doing what they're doing so i think it's kind of like a mirrored reflection to you know our collective behavior because we want more we want more stuff we want cheaper goods you know everyone is kind of thinking about themselves it's hard to figure out if this is, um, you know, being done on purpose by some maybe higher force manipulating this whole situation, or if this is just, you know, reflection of behavior of, of, of people. What do you think? Absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. Completely agree with it because it's a symbiotic relationship. And it's like the degree to which people allow, disempower themselves and allow, there's, there's a vacuum in reality, right? When we disown our own power, when we disown our own agency and sovereignty, that gets filled by something else that imposes its own will. It's just a, it's like a natural law. And, yeah. and so I completely agree with you. Yeah, the complicity of all of us, those people who shop at Amazon, then complain about small stores disappearing and there being a monopoly on products. And potentially in the coming decade, uh, you know, once Amazon has complete ownership of pretty much the whole supply chain, they can limit the kind of products that are available and no one will have any say in that. And it was us that did that, all of us who shopped there, who didn't support the small stores because it was convenient. So, but that's just a sort of a simple thing, but I completely agree with you. It's a, without, it's, we are completely complicit in anything and everything that happens by not acknowledging it, by living in our own shadow. Um, okay, maybe we can just go a little bit into the symbols presented in a movie. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. I, I guess some of them are self-explanatory, but I want to also hear your views. So, for example, one of the basic things we see from the beginning of the movie is that people have holes in their heart center. Is this just something that people are heartless? Cold, like that was the intention behind it. Mm. Yeah, it's. I think that's definitely the most obvious interpretation, I guess. And part, what I meant from by that was, 
my experience of the inner hole of lack, this eternal feeling of, of lack and not enoughness, mm. uh, and this dissociation from our true self, which has never been accessed due to either a lack of introspection, um, any inner work, self-reflection, but that deep hole, um, it, for it to be fulfilled, it needs something greater than just external objects of validation, whether they're physical, uh, whether they're validation in the form of rewards, achievement, uh, image building um, through social media, any sort of achievements, career, whatever they are, we're trying to fill that sense of lack, that empty mm. hole, and it can never be filled yeah. externally, right? Uh, so that's what I was trying to to convey with that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of um, it's never enough. It's whether it's like your validation from people outside of you or material possessions. It's always like you want more and more and more and more. It never ends. So you never are fully satisfied, and you have to find satisfaction inside of you, right? That internal happiness. Yeah, yeah, because it's a perpetual avoidance of the inner landscape of where we actually are. Because it's when we start looking inward, before seeing the 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 you know the bliss, the satisfaction, the fulfillment of our own light, there's a lot of discomfort and again trauma in the way, and that we just do not want to face. We don't have the tool personally or culturally to access those parts and to stay in that discomfort so that we can unravel what is in the way. And so it's much easier to then just look with like outside again and, and just try to satisfy that pain by again, whether it's achieving through hyper success, um, whatever it is, avoiding the inner journey. Because again, we don't have a map for it right now. We're suffering, we're malnourished by a lack of wisdom, elders, um, and, 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 a, and a cultural map and framework for doing this deep dive, this journey of unraveling the truth within us, of healing, uh, and, and, and coming to the truth of who we are and what this experience and matter is. Okay. How about, uh, you know, we often see a lot of the figures in the movie have squares on, on their heads. Like, I assume it's some kind of narrow mindedness, right? Like thinking based on some specific kind of conditions, like, you know, repetitive pattern. Like, I there is a, one moment where you have, uh, class and the teacher comes and sucks in the creativity right from the child mm -hmm. so that seems to me like you know people are naturally creative but then the system is putting us in a box mm -hmm. and makes us think in a specific way is this the meaning of these squares um, yeah that definitely that is was the my mean. interpretation for sure and i, I just want to say before i go into that um I was hesitant for the last three years to to speak at all about the meaning of anything in this in this short film because my interpretation could then be confused as some sort of like definitive statement on the film. And the reason it's visual is because words are not sufficient in what I wanted to communicate and also because the audience's conscious participation in the film has added so much more to my understanding of what was being expressed. Um, because these symbols are so rife with meaning and many people can see them from different ways and really add to the truth. So, uh, yeah, what you're saying makes complete sense and I agree with it. Um, and then to go further with some, some of my own insights, um, yeah, the cube is certainly a, a binding, a binding symbol as I see it. Um, you know, the square represents matter. Um, as opposed to spirit and matter, as I mentioned, in my view, is, is, is more of a cyclical, programmable, automated process. And so the cubes themselves are um, 
they're they're in a way reality constructs they're conceptual boxes they're conceptual prisons so conceptual prison could be anything from uh, materialistic scientism you know to churchianity which is just you know <laughs> you, you get what I mean by that or by any political ideology I mean we see that happening right now right this sort of insurgency movement in the United States the way I see it is clearly um, you know that's maybe too much to get into right now but there is a big conflict right now uh, happening of the, the suppression of, of, of free thinking individuals who dare think outside of the imposed dictates of the authoritarians and the authoritarians are just pawns within this greater system of like our own disowned unconsciousness which is in a way empowering these individuals to act as, as, as uh, enforcers of, of limitation and, and consciousness but sorry I'm deviating too far I just want to say the red boxes essentially are any limited framework which filters our understanding and our viewing of reality so if I see just um, if the box that I'm wearing paints everything as just like an oppressor and victim dynamic then that's how I experience reality if all I see is is, is you know um, whatever it is that it just limits my experience of reality and those boxes um, we willingly take them on because reality is complicated and based on our own traumas and shadows we are more prone to select certain ideologies than others right because they fulfill our own um, our own needs um, and many of them are installed on us in a way we download them like the new app the, new, the newest app gets uh, issued uh, and and we're ready to download the, the latest sort of ideology to make sense of things to make us feel better especially the young people there's a certain rebellious energy that that wants to be right wants to be uh, anti-establishment and that's really being subverted right now for the interests mm -hmm. of this dark empire yeah and it's always like people argue which kind of box is more important or the real one but everything is just a perception and you know it's like half truths or everything is based on some half truths and perception and ideas it's like you know having 40,000 denominations of Christianity trying to interpret the same thing from all these different ways and all these different lenses Mm -hmm. and then arguing who is right mm -hmm. which one is the the real one yeah it's interesting like uh, it's funny how people don't even notice these things you know mm -hmm. everyone speaks from that point of authority like this is the truth but it's all kind of you know limited perception looking at the same thing from a different angle mm -hmm. yeah. what about these um you know you show people having this kind of liquidish smoke behind their backs around them what's the meaning mm -hmm. this is like what's your kind of um you know your personal meaning yeah um yeah so that came about just like many things in the film came about and from an intuitive feeling of how i saw things so not everything has a specific like definition but with that darkness it just it, there was a feeling of something of a it's almost like an outpouring of shadow outpouring of disowned inner content of uh, an awareness of a deep unconsciousness which creates pain and suffering for oneself and for others and it's almost like there's such an overload of that unprocessed shadow that it sort of like steams out you know it's, it's it you could almost you could see it also in another way it's like etheric dark beings that have attached into the traumas of those individuals and and are from like a different uh density just like informing their behavior infusing and incentivizing the horror that they may be enacting or just the you know whatever sort of function they're they're enacting within this reality so it, it, it's it's more of an abstract feeling of um yeah an o overload of of let's just say darkness hmm. yeah it's interesting you mentioned these kind of etheric beings because you know obviously we know about all these conspiracies and archons or um, you know all these concepts um, but 
sometimes I'm thinking if I look at the way the world works, like it seems like there is almost like a hidden hand, some kind of manipulation going on. And, you know, I was kind of having this thought experiment or like I was sharing it with people. Um, think about how we treat animals. We treat them like some kind of resources that don't have any sentience or any kind of emotions or feelings or anything like that. We just, you know, we, we, maybe there is a higher level and someone uses us the same way as we use resources or plants or animals, but there is just, uh, you know, they are more advanced. So they understand the laws of physics and other things on the deeper level. So they could create like this playground for us that makes us believe that we are living, um, you know, in a reality, which in fact is just like, we are like free ranch chicken running in some kind of experiment and generate some emotions. And someone is just like, you know, feeding on these emotions, like yeah. everything we do is kind of generating emotions. So a lot of people believe like, you know, just materialistic possessions and, you know, chasing all these things. And then this process creates a lot of negative emotions and you're never satisfied anyway. So it's like never ending cycle. And most people are programmed to believe that this is the, the life. This is how we should live life. And I was thinking maybe this is like, like this big trick, you know, that mm. there is actually a higher order and the same way as we treat animals and use them for our benefits. Something is using us. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, nothing's for me, nothing is too wild to consider. Um, <laughs> I personally love putting really casting out these big ideas and then just substantiating them slowly by by more data but what do i think about that yeah i think it's entirely possible um i, I don't know what what else to say beyond that uh i don't have too much data on it but i think what what i can say is maybe repeating something from what i said earlier is we are clearly caught up under a whole bunch of laws that are beyond our control you know physical laws uh just laws that things work things tend to work even just in the emotional the astral realms that affect us and when we don't know what those laws and forces are then we are puppets to those laws they could be let's just for the sake of argument assume that they're impersonal laws which shape our existence so that everything can be the way it is right so that we can be in our physical reality so we can think talk speak there can be wind water with all of its laws right and when we don't understand the inner laws and of consciousness then we fall prey to them you know even if we look at a astrological sort of influence uh, the influence of the constellations and the planets in our space our place in space if we are not aware of those influences then they will make us do certain things because we are unconscious and we sort of we can be more prone to be angry or more prone to be cheated or lied to on a certain day or be jealous or whatever it is to have no inner sovereignty to have no boundaries um, but that's because we are blind to the forces once we start individuating and looking deeper and purifying those unconscious parts then that hidden hand that you speak of then that like you know being the the chickens in the pen then we can start realizing like wait a minute that's a fence and there's something outside of the fence wait a minute i could go outside of the fence and those are steps of conscious evolution of understanding and broadening our our understanding of like our space and possibility it's just like the hbo show westworld and i'm sure other people have made these analogies but have you seen westworld Oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually just repeat that. So it's very much like that HBO show, uh, Westworld. It's Westworld is essentially about uh, a big theme park in which cyborgs are used for the pleasure and role-playing of human beings, which come in and play with them. But gradually, 
those cyborgs, those robots, start becoming sentient and self-conscious and self-aware of what's happening to them. Previous to that, they were just running programs in this game for humans to come in and play with them. They could violate them, they could kill them, they could ally themselves with them, and every day these robots would just go through the same programs. So that HBO show is a great allegory for the awakening of consciousness in human beings in which we start seeing through our programs, our personal, collective, cultural programs, and start earning the right to have a choice, to actually make a choice, to be like, wait, there is a greater landscape, wait, there is a hidden hand, there's people in a control room programming me as a cyborg to run through these programs. That's a wild idea, but it seems to be true because I'm experiencing it now. So it's these like layers of, of, of greater and greater understanding and then acting accordingly to, in a way to then integrate that understanding into a higher order of being and becoming more and more sentient and human. And so these cyborgs, in a way, gradually earn their right to be sentient creatures. Um, and I'm not in any way, I'm not here saying that machines can be humans, um, but... Um, what about, like, we see these television anchors having some kind of pipes um, hooked to their heads? Can you, can you tell us the meaning of this? What's your, what was your intention behind it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that one's kind of self-evident. It's There is no real reporting, there is no real information uh, being divulged. There are um, authorized interpretations of events that are promulgated and synchronized uh, among all mainstream media. Um, and they don't come from well-intentioned anchors, journalists. You know, we don't, we no longer have investigative journalism. We don't really have journalism either. So it's it's just um, an indication, a very blunt, direct <laughs> indication of the nature of regurgitation of what is called or what passes as news these days. It's interesting because um, you know, with other things like you portray someone creating a movie, and then these um, you know individuals kind of narrating or putting ideas for the movies or with celebrities, you know, they're on the leash. So almost anything that is in the public uh, domain is kind of manipulated to create perception, right? Or some agenda. Yeah, um, maybe I won't, I wouldn't, I guess, be as extreme to say that everything is, but um, yeah, there is a lot, a lot of the main, I would say, no, I wouldn't even maybe go that far, but yeah, that's, that is what it indicates. No. What about, um, there is this moment in a movie where people are kind of, you have arrows pointing at people and then they have lamps behind them. I was thinking this is just like narcissism. Yeah. Just look at me. Like, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is narcissism. Um, it's self-centered narcissism, which which uh, uses all of these personal egoic enhancements in place for unfolding the true self and knowing oneself fully and relating to other human beings in a truthful way. Instead, it's commodifying oneself as an object who is part of this uh, ecosystem of status where people just trade in status and, and, and craft their image. And you know that came about living in Toronto, just like all these big cities, you have a you know big scene and this around 2012, um, sort of the, the hipsters and the scenesters and individuals like that, um, just around my neighborhood it was there were a lot of uh, empty. Anyway, I'm not going to go into personal things, but I remember there was there was a, there was a certain annoyance that I felt with a holier than thou attitude. Uh, there was an elitist attitude of coolness, which was not backed up by substance, and um, I'm, I'm pretty allergic to that. So I immortalized some of these image, some of these people in the shadow. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 No, I've, it's, I'm, I noticed that sometimes as well. Mm. Like, you know, someone's having tattoos and then, then kind of they defined their personality instead of like expressing the personality. Like, they are the tattoos. This is their personality instead of just kind of like being a symbol of something deeper. Mm-hmm. It's kind of funny. It's, you know, being cool is is the most important. And anyway, but this is again like, I don't like to judge, but sometimes it's hard not to. <laughs> it's just yeah. funny yeah. to observe. Yeah, uh, and I think that the whole status okay. game. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Yes, the stat- status thing, it's often very visible, uh, you know, especially in like Western countries like US or even here in big cities in Poland, I'm noticing that quite a lot. It's like, you know, I'm better if I have better car or bigger house, like this kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what were you saying about it? Um, yeah, the, the, the status game is, it's another you know, red square, red box around us. And it, I guess we formulate our conduct in our society based on this primal circuit of where we, we fit within the social hierarchy and the social order, uh, based on the symbols that give us primacy. So the symbols being like, you know, again, like whatever the appearance or the this is these are the shows i saw or this is where i traveled all of these little enhancements it's like lego pieces just building our our persona personality our our social avatar uh but yeah it's caught up in that in that game of of one-upmanship and just staying relevant and having that whole the whole of like not knowing ourselves completely constantly pushing it and stuffing things in it um can, can you tell us a little bit like what's the idea um, of the end of the movie? Because to me, it wasn't like as clear as like a lot of these symbols kind of are self-explanatory, but maybe you can tell us what's your interpretation of the end of the movie when, you know, like the shadow side is integrated or awakening is happening. I mean, to me, it's kind of, I'm, I'm curious what, what was mm-hmm. your uh, way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would rather avoid that, but I will, I will say some things about it. And, you know, I've had people um, write to me who have said it much better than I could ever say it because there is an inherent truth in the way that the film ends. Um, but the way that it's framed verbally, um, has there are various ways they're not different they're just pointing from different directions and so i'll take i'll take a stab at that but by the end of the movie do you mean uh what parts just so i'm clear because i'm just imagining like the last shot or two what what part are you thinking yeah i mean like there is um you know like this figure waking up going to the cosmos i think this starts around there Mm, yeah yeah, so it's in a very brief way, it's about going deep within, being, going through the, as I mentioned earlier, there's an element of, of suffering through the purification of all of those shadow aspects. So it's going through the purifying fire, facing the depth of ourselves, that deep ego slash evil slash material realm, which is part of us, which is part of our evolutionary journey really knowing and facing that and subsuming it in a greater consciousness in a greater knowing shedding shedding away all the false shells of darkness moving toward light past all the sleepers those who have chosen to sleep those who have chosen to sink into their patterns and remain in a robotic consciousness and that's totally fine because it's a choice of free will moving past that in this ascendant path um, I'm skipping ahead, but ultimately, uh, you know, uniting the polar opposites, which unite us into this one unity uh, in the psyche of the masculine and feminine aspects, which all of us have to various degrees, uh, interpenetrating those, marrying them, 
And that's a very simple way to put it that in itself is a, a full, deep um, conversation and topic of contemplation. And, and it's bridging the gap between our world and the other world. So the material world of human perception, narratives, uh, etc. The fallen world, the decaying world, the world of fleeting illusions, and then the world of the permanent, the world of spirit, of God, you know, whatever that that word can be perhaps confusing and triggering to some people, but I mean it in the broadest sense of this ordering principle. And from there, from the, the yeah, unification... see the motif. So... Yeah. Go ahead. You know, I was saying I, I could see pineal gland and that kind of fractal reality or something. I, I felt like this is probably your experiences with psychedelics. Hmm. Kind of yeah. Higher consciousness, fractal patterns. Like. Mm -hmm. So um, I was listening to your previous interviews and you were actually saying that there is a meaning behind the length of the movie, which is 13 minutes exactly. And also you released it on 13th of November, 11-11-1-3. Hmm. Um, you know, 13 is an interesting number. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about it? Like, you know, mm -hmm. what was the intention? Mm -hmm. So I, I, it wasn't fully intentional, but when I saw the opening for where I thought I was guided, I took the opportunity. And in fact, uh, the number 13, I wasn't very familiar with it until I used that synchronistic guidance to follow the trail and see where it led me. But 13, in, in my understanding, and I'm no expert in, in these matters, but 13 is, is a number of completion. It's a number of death in the tarot card. It is the death card, which is a renewal. It's the death of the old and the final opportunity of birth of the new. It's like a forest fire, which burns down the old trees and vegetation and, and creates an opportunity for, for new growth and new revitalization. Um, 13 is also the, the point. I mean, you have the 12 disciples, you have Christ. You have many allegories in which 13 seems to be the cap that is the the point which leads to, in a way, escape from the matrix, you could say. You have the 12 cycles, the, the 12 constellations. You have many, our reality is broken up in many sort of like pies of, of 12. Uh, the cube itself has you know, the 12 lines to bank it. Um, and the 13 is 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 also it's it's actually very symbolic of our time right now. So it's a it's a number of uh, renewal, revelation. Uh, there's an apocalyptic thing to it, which you know apocalypse means revelation. Um, and so I was in a way the film was being pushed over 13 minutes, and I thought it would be very appropriate for it to be exactly 13 and see what um, kind of magical effect that had on the whole experience of of the film. And yeah, November 13th came as well. Um, and I thought that was the most appropriate time to release it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think these uh, numbers have symbols. Um, they're, they kind of reflect reality um, to some extent. So they're kind of like, same way like a logo can compress idea ideas like if you have um, numbers they can also express something because it, numbers in a way express reality so that's interesting um, you know it's interesting also I don't think I see our art is such a powerful medium you know and we don't see that many artists going uh, into this direction to show the world um, these kind of concepts you know wake them up a little bit you don't have that many movies um, the other actually animator that I'm familiar with is Steve Cutts you 
probably know yeah. about him. Yeah, I know his work. Yeah. Yeah, but but we don't see that many. I mean, it's interesting. Why do you think? Um, you know, we don't see a lot of um, you know messages like yours in art, not only in a movie, but in different forms of art. What do you mm -hmm. think is is the reason? Do you think that there are not that many people who are perceiving the w things the way you and me are, or do you think it's just hard to live and create free stuff because you know it obviously takes time. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly takes time. It doesn't have to be free, but yeah. What, what's your view? Like, why do we don't see more more of this kind of artwork? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a certain subset of the population is interested in unfolding to to truth and considering these sort of topics. So that population is represented, I think, probably somewhat equally across the the spectrum of different careers and interests, right? So you go into regular work in an office, there's going to be a very small subset of people interested in that, just like there would be in the music industry. Maybe the music industry would be higher, but, you know, um, whatever, software development or police officers or, you know, the, the, the Medicare. Like, I think there's just a smaller subset of those individuals, just like there is in art. And one would think that art somehow creates more free-thinking individuals who are more lucid in their seeing, but I, I don't think that's true. In fact, art can, can have much more neurotic and, and, and convoluted individuals, you know, with um, who just need to express their traumas and work it out through art. And that's fine. It is what it is. But I think to create a meaningful piece of art, it, there's like a... There's a cross. There's it's an, it has to be an intersection of cr uh, craft, of a personal will and ability to make something and follow through. Uh, then a vision, understanding, and the ability to articulate it. So it's a cross section of of a, of a number of skills that need to need to materialize in order for that piece of art to happen. Uh, also, this stuff takes time and especially in, in the form of film and animation, it takes money as well, and it takes a team. Um, and it's difficult to get people on board when there's no money and you need a team to do it. Uh, and when there is money, uh, you know, I think there's a strong case to be made that certain messages are disincentivized in, in, in Hollywood, of course, and mainstream media. Uh, so there's a certain gatekeeping that happens with the uh, following specific interpretations of events, realities of history, and that's all we can really do in movies. So, you know, there's some, some, some movies of 20th century historical occurrences that I can't make, no one can really make. They're legitimate, you know. Um, case in point, like, how many blockbuster films have there been about the gulags and communism? You know, I haven't seen any. I'd love to see one. Yeah. I'd love to see one about, uh, you know, what happened in Bulgaria, what happened in China and Russia and Cambodia. You know, it's interesting because if you think about it, um, you cannot produce work without the money. But if there is money involved, then there might be, like you said, gatekeepers or the message might be diluted or whatever. But so in order for people to see the truth, they should support the artists. And because, you know, people kind of often are selfish, don't think about it, they cannot get uh, this kind of work created. So again, it's related to their personal choices. You know, you can vote with your dollars in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, this work would be available if people would support artists like you, for example, right? Mm. But so it's kind of like, again, it's there is this reflection of like what people do and what they get. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's true. That I agree with that. Yeah. Also, I just want to mention that in, you know, whether it's animation or the art world, everyone suffers from the same um, afflictions, which are wanting to belong, wanting to be successful within that field based on what the rules are. So the rules generally are do these kind of kinds of things, 
appear to be this sort of person and build your image accordingly, right? And I see that again in the art art field, of course, a lot. So um, yeah, there are topics and there are views of reality that are not in, they're they're not rewarded. In fact, they're there it's the opposite and right now uh, you know the hot hot phrase of, of you know this year with cancel culture really heating up you essentially have a where people used to be canceled by the kings and queens and you just be shot on the street uh when they didn't follow the the political dictates now we have a democratized culture in which people can just gang up and and be sort of the, the foot soldiers of of empire to to cancel art or any sort of expression that veers off from from the the limited narrative and that of course you know being publicly shamed being turned into a villain or being uh economically dispossessed you know being impoverished because one chooses to explore a certain area which is what humans should be doing and putting their ideas out there and just comparing them and being like how about this when that's deeply disincentivized by this hostility in the public square you know, and it's fueled by empire, then how can we have artists, you know, um, do that? So it, it really, it takes people with uh, courage, with not much to lose, uh, not many dependents around them, and it takes uh, certain individuals to really do that work. And, and I'm not putting myself in there right now. I don't think, I didn't risk anything by making a shadow. I don't think, again, there, none of that was involved, but I think we're in a very heated time right now where speaking truth is um, is very difficult and even figuring out what truth is is very difficult because we we are not allowed to put all the facts on the table right now we never were allowed to put all the facts on the table but the fact that we can all communicate right now in this ex very expressed fast way uh, it makes it very difficult to for empire to really uh, curate reality and facts so they have to go on this this super turbocharged, um, you know, way of of suppressing all dissenting um, opinions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what was the, you know, feedback once the movie was released? You had a lot of people giving you feedback, probably contacting you. Um, was it what you expected? Hmm. Did you learn anything? Yeah. yeah, I learned some things. I well, I you know, I guess I learned them at the moment. I don't remember all the insights I, I've I've got from uh, various uh, members of the audience who have written to me. But uh, what I was surprised at is that it actually has made a big impact in some people's lives. Um, I've had, you know, personal correspondences with some of those people, and still get messages. When that really re reinvigorated my belief in art, and really renewed my sense of uh, the mission of art and its ability to enact change. So people who were, you know, whether they were stuck, they were in a very bad place, they were on their way down and out of this world, and having this film bring them up and be sort of like a punch to the gut in an invigorating way where it just like ignited their their warrior spirit their spirit mm -hmm. of the dignity of being human beings who can be sovereign and take charge of their own lives uh, and ignite their spirit in a way that, that that pushes out into life and truly lives and participates in life on their own terms um, like seeing something like that that's amazing it's incredible it's more than I could have anticipated or asked for uh, it's pretty humbling and it has nothing to do with me it has to do with the piece of art that exists now this 13 minute film because it's it's its own separate entity you know I don't I can't even speak very much about it I just sort of like every now and then I watch it just like everyone else and try to see what it's about <laughs> because it's it's really like outside of me in a way I birthed it I went through the birthing pains and now it's just out there to be experienced as, as its own entity. I don't really, has nothing to do with me anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm in a, you know, it's, it's still finding its audience. Uh, people are still benefiting from it, coming back to it as a, as a sort of a, a periodic floss and rejuvenation in their own 
being uh, to inspire them. And I, I love that it serves that purpose to you know get the get the troops ready for for the battle of, of sovereignty of, of of goodwill of of being whole of doing the work. Are you planning the second part? <laughs> yeah, people are looking forward to into light, and uh, I think that's that's very necessary. But um, I'm not planning uh, another one. I'm planning some other projects, and we'll see if they come to fruition. But uh, I am not planning anything right now. Anything on your mind? Anything you want to share? Mm, no, no, not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just watch the movie if you haven't yet. <laughs> All right, so yeah. I think we're going to um, finish the conversation. It was Great. really amazing to talk to you and uh, again, in shadow, it's available for free on YouTube, Vimeo. Just search it in Google, you can find it, and we're going to include the links as well. So thanks for tuning in to this Truth Theory podcast episode, and until next time.